Hallelujah and hello family. Welcome back. Hey, thank you for stopping by and doing Bible study with me today. Um, today we're going to be wrapping up Romans chapter 16. This is the last chapter of the book of Romans. Really? We did it. We did it. All of Romans chapter 16. If this is your first time here, you can check out the other videos where we started at Romans chapter 1. So those of you who have been with me all this time, I hope you have filled, you've, you've actually had just a great blessed experience. So today we're going to jump right in. We, of course, need to grab all of our resources and tools. Um, first thing, of course, we need is time. You know, there's no way to get around it in order to do Bible study. You just need need time. You know, that's all, all to it. If you are short on time, one thing you can do is just divide this up into segments. You know, you don't have to listen to the whole thing in one day. Just take your time and just really enjoy your time uh, communing with the Father. So today we're going to just be using the Berean Study Bible. And guess what? You can get that for free. Um, you can also order a hard copy, and I'll give you details in this video on how you can actually uh, get that. Download it straight to your computer if you don't have access to the internet. Um, you know, you could actually find some way to uh, hopefully get with a friend or something where you can actually download it, get a copy, have one mailed to you because they do have physical copies. Also, you'll need like an additional phone or tablet because through Throughout the video, you'll see QR codes and you'll actually need something else to scan that QR code with. Um, and of course, your favorite highlighter, journals, pens, and pencils. Again, that's for us to just jump in, enjoy that time, not feel stressed, reminding ourselves that we're communing with God. We're not just studying the Bible, but we're actually communing with the Father. So with that said, I always like to remind myself or why we do what we do. And so I was listening to Beth Morton uh, this week and she did a, a, a session on resetting the compass. And that's part one. You can find that on TBN. You might be able to Google it, but check out this quote. She says, we are disciples of Christ. Our direction is north and south. Our direction is up to the throne of God who rules over the kingdom of heaven and the universe that he brought into being out of nothing and down south to the pages of scripture. Our entire value system is built up and down, not right and left. I thought that was powerful. You know, so when you get a chance, take a listen to that. But basically, she's just saying, you know, we we do a lot of a lot of things are distracting us nowadays. We're looking left, right, all over the place. You know, there's a scripture that I used to love to to sing, and it would say, I I know the way that it's in the man, it's not in himself. It's in the it's not in the man that walketh to direct his steps. The Lord says He directs our steps. So she just reminded me, you know, that we look up to God and we look down to the pages of scripture and everything else is just a distraction and busyness and noise. So I just wanted to share that with you again. Check out that actual teaching. So what is our why this week? You know, we have several things that we've said in John 17. Why do we study the Bible? Beth Moore just reminded us of that. Um, but here's an actual scripture to actually, you could listen listen to and it's God has transmitted his very substance into every scripture for it is God breathed it will empower you by its instruction and correction giving you the strength to take the right direction and lead you deeper into the path of godliness then you will be God's servant fully mature and perfectly prepared to fulfill any assignment God gives you. And that's from the Passion Translation. Um, again, check that out. God breathed every scripture. Back to Beth Moore. We look north, up to the throne of God, and south, down to the pages of scripture. So we know that it's God breathed. That's why I encourage you just to enjoy this time. Don't do it when you're in a rush. Don't do it when you have distractions. Don't do it. Just carve out that time and you will see how your life will change. Um, we, again, we're going to be using the Berean Study Bible. So if you're interested, here's how you can receive your copy. 
Okay, so if you want a copy of the Berean Study Bible, you can go to Berean, uh, I believe it's actually Berean.Bible, and you will come or land on this page. On this page, you have uh, some options here. You can actually download the entire Bible for free, or you can actually order a hard copy if you want to actually, you know, um, highlight directly in the physical copy. Um, but if you click here on free downloads, that will allow you, give you a lot of options on how you want to download this. They even have a Kindle option you can use. Um, but you have the book PDF and then you have a linked PDF. And what that will allow you to do is click on Genesis and it will take you directly there without you having to scroll the entire Bible. And they have the Word document, um, which I like to use because then you can format the Bible as you're studying it. Um, you can write in your comments, insert comments in Word, whatever feature Word has, you can use within that document. And then you can just save it as, you know, your name, Becky's Berean Study Bible, and then go from there. So hopefully that's helpful to you again. That's again, Berean Study Bible, and you can go directly to Berean.Bible to find this. So that's the actual translation that we will be using today. So now we go ahead and we go into one of my favorite parts, and that's called what I call scripturally focused breathing or spiritually focused breathing. Um, again, reminding ourselves that another word or the Hebrew word R-U-A-C-H, the Ruach, or the Greek word P-N-E-U-M-A, indicates when breath or spirit. And so when we breathe, we're just reminding ourselves that we live and breathe. We have our being by the very breath of God. And so when we think of uh, the breath that we take and we center in on that, that is a quick way to remind us that God is a very present God. He's, he's near to us by his very breath. And the ver actual first use of, uh, that we see of this is in Genesis 1 and 2. And then in Genesis 6 and 17, where Ruach is translated as the breath of life. Genesis 8, 1 also uses Ruach to describe the wind. Okay, so when we breathe in again, that's just a reminder that God is so near. He's so near. He's as near as the breath that we breathe on a daily basis. So what we're going to do, I kind of made this through this tradition called Lectio Divina. And you've seen that probably on some of the previous videos. But just here's a just a reminder of what it is. And it's a traditional monastic practice practice of scriptural reading, meditation, and prayer intended to promote communion with God and to increase the knowledge of God's word. In the view of one commentator, it does not treat scripture as text to be studied, but as the living word. And you can find more about that on Wikipedia. Really what it is, is where you go through, you read the scripture four times. The first time you just read it straight through. The second time you meditate on it. The third time you may pray it. You may put your name there. And then the fourth time you just contemplate on it. But now in those times where you're contemplating and meditating, allow the Holy Spirit just to emphasize specific words in that passage. So what we'll do is we'll breathe in between uh, doing this. So the first scripture or this scripture for today is found in John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus responded and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and we will make a place to stay with him. Some translation says, we will take up residence with him. So with that said, go ahead and take a deep breath through your nostrils on the count of three. One, two, three. Exhale slowly. Now this time I'm going to read it um, at a slower pace to give you a chance to meditate on it. Jesus responded and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word 
and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and we will make a place to stay with him. Inhale. Exhale. Now this time we'll read it at a slower pace. And this time, try to put your name there. So where you see him, put your name. So here we go. Jesus responded and said to me, If you love me, and if you keep my word, my Father will love you, and we will come to you, and we will make a place to stay with you. Inhale for three, exhale for seven. Last time, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Jesus responded and said to me, If anyone, if you love me and you keep my word, my Father will love you. We will come to you and we will make a place to stay with you. So now that we've had a time to just breathe and settle ourselves down, um, you might have had a lot going on today or you have a lot going on um, um, in your upcoming morning, evening, or afternoon. So let's just pray and we just ask God to bless the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his word. So if you'll join with me, he says in his word that if any of you on earth agree as touching we don't have to touch but we when we come into agreement it's very powerful so read this along with me agree with this uh along with me so let's just take a look our father we call you abba father we thank you for allowing each of us to see this day we acknowledge you as lord and king over our lives Father, step into every area of our lives. We yield ourselves to you. We thank you for the privilege of communing with you as we study your word. Thank you for your almighty hand in our lives. Thank you for the blessing of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for leading and guiding us. All this we pray and believe in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we also, it's a good practice again. We haven't even started studying, right? And so, like I said, you do what you need to do because you know how to divvy up your own time. But this is a time where we also worship. We go into Bible study with worship. Um, and so let's just talk about what actually is worship. You know, you hear it so much. And I think that in a way, um, the enemy, it says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And if he gets us or allows us or puts us in a position where we're ignorant about something, you know, we don't get the full benefit of it. So if you just take a look at this, this, if you look at that diagram in the middle, that's all the different ways that you see. If you were reading, for instance, in the um, English Standard Version of the Bible, all of the different meanings or variations that you see of the word worship. What do I mean? Like you'll see worship in the Bible or worshiping or worshiper. Um, and so the Hebrew words, if you see that in the middle, I don't speak he Hebrew or Greek, but some of you might, but those are the different variations in Hebrew. And then if you look at the bottom, those are the different variations of the word worship in Greek. So what does that say? That means that when I'm reading a particular scripture, we can have a general idea of what worship is, but it's also good to have like a concordance to really see, hey, in this scripture, um, I see that worship was expressed because he gave a, an offering or worship was expressed because he bowed down 
or worship was expressed because he uh, extolled the name of God. And so that's why we look at things individually to take them in context. So here's a general overview of worship. I think it was a good way to wrap it all up. It says the act of adoring and praising God. That is ascribing worth to God as the one who deserves homage and service. The church which is to be a worshiping community, that's found in 1 Peter 2 and 5, expresses its worship corporately and publicly through prayer, that's one way, through psalms, through hymns and spiritual songs, through the reading and exposition of scripture, that's what we're doing now, through observance of the sacraments, you know, when we take communion and other sacraments of the church, and through individual, right there, and corporate living in holiness and service. You can find that from the pocket dictionary of theological terms. So again, that's a good overall view. So when you hear the worship word worship, don't just think of songs or singing. That's just one of the outflows of worship, what it means to worship the Father. So listen to this. Worship may be regarded as the direct acknowledgement to God of his nature, of his attributes, his ways and claims, whether by the outgoing of the heart in praise and thanksgiving or by deed done in such acknowledgement, right? So that's why you can worship when you're reading your Bible. You can worship when you're doing this Bible study with me, right? So that's why we don't say, well, you know, I don't have time. I, I, I don't have time to read my Bible because that's almost like saying, well, I don't have time to worship. Right. Because I know that seems extreme, but if studying your Bible and communing with God is a way that we worship, you want to carve out time for that. So let's take a look. That was um, in Psalm 68 verse four through five. That's a verse we're going to take a look at. And this, again, remember, this is an example of one way to worship is by singing. It is not the only way. So here's an actual scripture. Again, that's from Psalm 68, verse four through five. And it reads, sing songs of praise to the name that belongs to the true God. Let your voices ring out in songs of praise to him, the one who rides through the desert, desert, deserted places. His name is the eternal. Celebrate in his glorious presence. And then in verse five, the true God, hmm, come on, who inhabits sacred space is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Oh my goodness. So again, another outflow or form of worship is to lift up the name of God in song, which we will do today. So repetition is good. If you listen to the last video, then hopefully you got this video or you've already searched it, downloaded, put it on your app, iPhone or whatever. It is called The Goodness of God by Bethel music. And as you listen to it, I want you to just allow the words to just be sown deep within your spirit. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able who oh, i will sing of the goodness of god 
Come on and sing that with me one more time. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Just take a moment right there and just worship him and think about the goodness of God. So I don't know about you, but all my life, he has been faithful. All my life, he has been so, so very good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And so when we think about his majesty and his greatness, just take a look at this. You know, when you look at the creation, it says his very creation testifies to who God is, his majesty, Elohim, the one who existed in the beginning, God, the almighty king, Lord of lords, the us in the beginning, he truly is good and we bless his holy name. So let's remember what we always say. Let's be like the Bereans and let's reason together. That's found in Acts chapter 17, verse 10 through 11. And today we really are going to be like them because we're going to use the Berean study Bible. Um, and again, I hope you are able to get that. But before we do, we're going to do our name of God for the week. And so this, um, there's a resource you can use um, that's pretty good, 100 Names of God. And then there's Names of God by Ann Spangler, I believe. And you can even do a Google search. But this week together, we are going to focus on Yahweh Makedesh. Now, who is that? What attribute? attribute of God is he trying to get across to us? Yahweh Makedesh. He's the Lord who sanctifies. He makes holy. And you can see a reference in Leviticus 20 verse 8, Ezekiel 37 verse 28. God makes it clear that he alone, not the law, can cleanse his people and make them holy. Man, that's fitting, especially finishing up Romans 16. Paul spent his whole time trying to remind us of that, that it is Yahweh Makedesh. He is the one who makes us holy. He's the one who sanctifies us. He's the one who justifies us. He's the one who has sent his son right? To be the great atonement, the final lamb to make the payment for all of our sins. So Yahweh Makedesh, as we go through this week, we reflect and we thank him. Jot that down in your notebook. Pause the video if you need to and just write that down. What is, what is Yahweh Makedesh saying to me this day? So we are ready to jump in. Yeah, I would suggest that you scan this QR code and you can use this while you're studying. So go ahead and pause the video, get your extra phone or tablet, scan that QR code using your camera or QR app, and you will be able to go directly to a website where you can print out and actually use this. So while we are, before we get started, we're going to do a C-Law early. That means we're going to pause and we're going to reflect or we're going to go into some reflection. Um, so here's some questions to think about. As you're reading, so while you're reading, 
What life lessons do you notice? You can even in your Bible put LL and circle that and say, hey, this is a life lesson. Um, In the chapter, where do you see the community of Christ? As we go through Romans chapter 16, where do you see Christ, the community that he builds? You know, he says, thank you, Holy Spirit, to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. He didn't say just build an individual. He didn't say just build Peter. He said, I will build my church church, the ecclesia, the call that ones and the gates of Hades or hell will not prevail against it. Okay. So think about that when you read chapter 16, then how important are godly relationships? How important do you think they are when you read this chapter? And who has God placed in your life that's helping you just to become? So, you know, you could think about that. Become what? Well, that's you get with God and that's where you find out who who am I to become? Who are you making me? Why was I sent here, God? What assignment did you give me? And who have you placed in my life that helps me to become? So just think about that as you are reading through this actual chapter. And then before we begin, we'll take a look at the outline of Romans 16. It says, final Paul, the apostle Paul, his final salutation. And so the first four verses, it's just a collection for the saints. And we're going to find a uh, learn about someone named Phoebe. And then uh, the next section, five through nine, is Paul's travel plans. And then Timothy and Apollos in verses 10 through 12, concluding the exhortations in 13 through 18, and then the final greetings. Okay, so we'll just, if you want to pause the video and jot that down, you can even mark it off in your actual Bible. Romans 16 Personal Greetings and Love I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. Welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her with anything she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who have risked their lives for me, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my beloved Epenetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow countrymen and fellow prisoners. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow countryman. Greet those from the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, women who have worked hard in the Lord. Greet my beloved Persis, who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send you greetings. Avoid divisions. Now I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Turn away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. 
By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Greetings from Paul's fellow workers. Timothy, my fellow worker, send you greetings, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my fellow countrymen. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who has hosted me in all the church, sends you greetings. Erastus, the city treasurer, sends you greetings, as does our brother Quartus. Doxology. Now to him who is able to strengthen you by my gospel and by the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery concealed for ages past, but now revealed and made known through the writings of the prophets by the command of the eternal God, in order to lead all nations to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. So I hope you're ready. Here we go. New Heights in God. I'm excited. Come and do Bible study with me. Okay, I hope you have a chance to get your Bible. Remember that this translation is the Berean Study Bible. They actually have a free digital download that you can use. You can even download that and use that as your actual um, journaling Bible if you like to do it digitally. But today we're going to just go ahead and go through this last chapter and I hope you're blessed by it as I was. But we're going to start first with the actual New Testament commentary. It's called the Life Application New Testament commentary that gives us an overview of the first 16 verses. So let's jump off. Rome was the capital of the empire as Jerusalem was the center of Jewish life. Rome was the world's political, religious, social, and economic center. As Paul preached in the eastern part of the empire, he went first to the key cities, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Syria, Philippi, Corinth, Athens and Ephesus. Along the way, he met many believers who eventually ended up in Rome. The fact that Paul knew the whereabouts of so many of his friends and co-workers gives us a glimpse into the interest this great missionary had in the people to whom he ministered and who ministered to him. This final chapter reveals a treasury of friends Paul expected to see in Rome. Okay, so you're not possibly not used to seeing this um, done this way, but again, you can use different programs while you're doing your Bible study. And one is you can use Microsoft Word, you can use Google Docs, um, and there are two ways to do this. You can adjust your margins so that you have space to write your notes, your thoughts, your questions, or you could use the insert common feature in one of those programs and then write down your thoughts. So let's begin with verse one. But before we do, I want you to think of this. When you're reading through, I want you to look at how Paul describes each of his friends. You know, you might get bogged down in the names and some of those names you may see in other places of the Bible. But the biggest thing I wanted to call your attention to is how he describes his friends, okay? So there's some different markings that I use. You have commend, and we'll look at that later. And it reads, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. So my comment here, when I actually look this up, that's just another word. She was actually a deaconess in the church. So, you know, I've even had, you know, um, that question put before me. And so it was good to actually see this biblically that, yes, you had uh, women who were in position, had uh, actual official position in the church. So let's look at this next actual resource. And this is called study verse by verse with Dr. Steve Shell. If you want to take note of that, I think you can find that on Amazon. And so let's just take a look. Paul introduces a Greek woman named Phoebe, the name of the Greek moon goddess. 
Undoubtedly, she was the person who carried his letter from Corinth to Rome and delivered it to the elders of the church. He's talking about the letter that we are reading. He tells them she has his strong personal recommendation. I commend to you literally, or I stand with her. So we saw that word commend earlier. That's actually what Paul was saying that, hey, you guys, I recommend, I recommend her. Okay. And so in your notes on the side, you could actually circle the word commend and in its place, write the word recommend. So let's continue. He calls her our sister and then states that either she is a deacon of the church, meaning she led some type of ministry or that she is a servant of the church, meaning she was very active serving the church in her hometown. Sincrea was a busy seaport near Corinth on the eastern side of the narrow strip of land which connects northern and southern Greece. Phoebe was, now again, this is from now switching back to the Life Application New Testament commentary. She was a servant or a deaconess in the church in Sincrea. She was wealthy. She, was, she supported Paul's ministry. She was highly regarded in the church and she was worthy of high honor. She most likely delivered Paul's letter from Corinth to Rome. Now check out this quote. This provides evidence that women had important, excuse that typo there, should say roles in the early church as well as important roles in business. So for those of you who are women under the sound of my voice, there should be no more question. You know, that's why we read the entire Bible because if we read one verse and we don't read the entire canon, the entire scripture, we can be convinced that, you know, women should just be quiet in the church. So I'm gonna leave that alone. You gotta decide what is in your own personal belief system. Um, so let me just, again, we'll just continue on with that. So verse two, welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. Now that's Paul and assist her with anything she may need from you for she has been a great help to many people. So again, uh, he's just talking about Phoebe, but notice how he describes her. He tells this church, he's saying she's a deaconess. She's worthy of high honor. Go ahead and welcome her. And matter of fact, she's been a great help to many people. So we continue on. When you're studying, it's always good to actually write some definitions so the, what you're reading becomes clear. So commend means to present as suitable for approval or acceptance, recommend. As we noted that earlier, and you see the great thumbs up from Paul. Okay, so he's going to continue on in verse 3, and he's going to continue to talk about some of his other friends. So read along with me. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow co-workers or workers in Christ Jesus. So let's just stop there. So when I did my research, and again, you can write this in your journal or on, in your notes. Prisca, in some translations, you'll see Priscilla. And you'll see another reference to her in uh, Acts 18, verse 2. And they met Paul in Corinth while he was on his second missionary journey. They invited Paul to live and work with them. So those two were married. Okay, you, you want to jot that down. But take note of the description. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to give us more information. He says who have risked their lives for me, right? And then he says, not only I, but all the churches of, Gen of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that beats at their house. So let's back up. So we get some information about this couple. I mean, this couple, they're married. They work with Paul. They've risked their lives. And notice that they have a church that meets at their house house. You know, a lot of times we think of just church being only a specific building, but the church or is the ecclesia, 
the called out ones. So it's not the building. It's when we get together on one accord, right? We forsake not the assembling of those. So when we're assembling, that is that is, the church is meeting at that time. So let's continue to read. Again, this quote is from, again, right? Study verse by verse with Dr. Steve Shell, the book of Romans. Let's check out this quote. First century believers had no formal buildings in which to gather. Smaller meetings were usually held in private homes and evangelism and teaching were done outdoors or in rented facilities. It makes me think of when, you know, back in the day, they would say there was a tent meeting. You know, a lot of the ministries got started. They didn't have this great building, but they met in tents. So this is another app that I would recommend to you if you want to jot that down uh, in your notes. It's the Filament app. They actually have a whole line of Bibles that go with it that makes that experience really neat. But I don't think you actually need the special Filament Bible to use it. If you buy the Filament app, you can still get a lot from it. Um, I don't want to go on about that, but just check that out when you get a chance. So here's the quote. The church in Rome was composed of a number of house churches where small groups of believers gathered for worship and instruction. So here we go. We're going to continue with verse five. Paul says, greet my beloved. And then we're going to try to take a shot at this actual um, name, Epinatus who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. So a lot of times when we think of, you know, some of these geographical locations, we think of how we see it. But if you look at the note, it says it was literally, um, literally you would see the, the translation would read in Asia. But so we'll get some information. Asia was a Roman province in what is now Western Turkey. Okay, so wrap your mind around that. So let's continue with verse six, another description. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard for you. He's talking about the believers in Rome. Look at verse seven, and then we're going to start off. So greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow countrymen and fellow prisoners, they are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ, look at this, before I was. Some translators will use the name Junius instead. But Paul takes the, I mean, again, look at that description. Highlight that. They are outstanding among the apostles. Okay, verse 8. Verse 8. Greet and plead, and pleadeth. I'm sorry, let me try that again. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Listen to that. My beloved in the Lord. Number nine, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Okay, so he, you know, Paul is in with these people. He's not just writing this letter and just saying, you know, listing their names. He's giving this church an indication of who they are. And so as we stop and pause for a moment, think about how would you want to be described? You know, if someone was writing a letter about you and when you think about your Christian life, how would you, what would be the paraphrase? What would be the description that would make you proud for someone to write about you. So let's continue on with verse 10. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Let me say that again, Aristobulus. So again, if you look at verse 10, he describes his friend Apelles, who is he approved in Christ? So I don't know about you. I think I'd want that actual uh, description to be approved in Christ. And we know we are all approved in Christ, but it's just so good when other people can look at you and say, hey, I can look at that individual and I can tell that they are approved in Christ. And then you have Greek Herodian, my fellow country, countryman. 
Greet those from the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Highlight that. Paul is saying, hey, these, they are in the actual, they're in the Lord. Nowhere else can you locate them. You can locate them in the Lord. And then let's continue on with verse 12. He has another person that he's listed here. He says, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa. Look at this. Women who have worked hard in the Lord. Go ahead and highlight that. And then after looking at uh, some research on these two women, um, they were possibly sisters or twins. Possibly sisters or twins. So again, more women. Greet my beloved Persis who has worked very hard in the Lord. My goodness, that's, there's another great description. Verse 13, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Now let's stop there. That's a good actual note. On Rufus, if you look in, into this and research, Rufus, they believe, was the son of Simon of Cyrene. He's the one that carried Jesus's cross when, if you ever saw Passion of the Christ, where it, 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 you know, the cross is getting too heavy because Jesus Christ has been whipped and he's been flogged. And so they have Simon of Cyrene come in and continue that cross. And from what I note about him, he was a North African. So you have Rufus, who possibly, if he was his son, who's also African. And so Paul says he is chosen in the Lord and not only him, his mother as well. I believe if you go back through and you count these people, um, those that were named and unnamed should come to a total of 29. So let's continue with verse 14. Greet a syncretist and then Phlegon, Hermes, and then Patrobos, Hermas, and the brothers with them. Now, he didn't give them a description, but, you know, we'll see. Verse 15, greet Philologus and Julia and Nereus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints with them. So Paul goes on. He tells, he gives them a huge list of those that he wants to send their greeting. He wants him them to know, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about you. So check out this note from the Dakes Annotated Reference Bible. Here is the quote. At least seven women are named in this chapter. Because remember, he doesn't name Rufus's mother. He just says in his mother. You have Phoebe in verse 1. You have Priscilla in verse 3, Mary in verse 6, Tryphena and Tryphosa, Persis in verse 12, Julia verse 15, and mention is made of an unnamed sister of Nereus. All of them were Christian workers, deaconesses, and prophetesses who labor in the Lord. This indicates that they labored in the ministry of the word. There were a number of prophetesses in the early church. Take a look at Acts 21, verse 9, close quote, right? So if we ever had a, qu a question of the role of women in the day of the Lord, in the, in the day of Paul, here's the proof right here. That's why we are Bereans and we don't allow someone to give us theology, but we study for ourselves. We search the scriptures. So let's go ahead with verse 16. So we've, we've gone through a list of all of Paul's friends. You know, we believe Phoebe is carrying this letter to the church in Rome. You know, if you go back and look at some of the history, Paul's in Corinth writing this letter. And then you have um, the married couple, right? Priscilla and Aquila, they have met Paul. And so there was a time where they were forced out of Rome and so they have returned back to Rome. So Phoebe is transferring these le this letter back to the believers in Rome. So I know that seems like a lot. Pause the video if you need to, to jot it down. That's how you keep 
what's going on in context. And before we go on, you can even pause the video and just, you know, take a seat off. Think about it. Think about it and and see, okay, how does this apply to me? And one thing you can think about is the way that Paul described each of these people. Okay, so let's continue with verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send you greetings. So then here, the actual tone of the letter is going to change. So he's, he's open with his greeting. And now he's going to talk about division within the church. Now we know that applies here today. So let's see what advice and wisdom he gives us. In verse 17, now I urge you brothers to watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Listen to this, turn away from them. So write down, what do you think about that? You know, even in today's church and the times that we're in, Paul's not messing around here. You know, is that is that advice we should still take today? And that's, that's, I know what my answer is. You have to formulate your own answer after you have read God's word, but he's saying, watch out, you know, and even with your pen, you can actually go ahead and underline that and, and highlight that. Cause he's saying, you know, there, that's a, a good warning. Watch out, watch out for who, for those who create divisions and obstacles that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. That's good. So make sure you highlight that. So here's another note from the Life Application New Testament commentary. These teachers were belittling the significance of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. Some claim that Jesus couldn't be God. Others claim that he couldn't have been a real man. So what is that, you know, what do we think about that today when we think about today's time? You know, you have a great number of people, they said, he says it in his word, will fall away. They'll fall away. And so Paul, they were experiencing that then. So we know what we're going through now. They're saying the same thing. You know, who was Jesus? He was just a prophet. He wasn't God. There are many ways to God. And so as Christians or as believers, we have to base our belief system. Let me say that again. We have to construct our belief system only on the word of God, not based on the voices that we hear today. Our belief system must be constricted or constrained and created and developed through the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the written word. Anything contrary to that, we cast it down. Okay, so you can actually just go ahead there and just list some of those verses, you know, that you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now. Like, for instance, I'm hearing casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself, exalts itself against God. That's what we do. That's what we do. And we do that by staying in his word. So let's continue with verse 18. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Well, you know, another way to think about that is the naive are are those who decide, thank you, Holy Spirit. He says in his word, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. We are naive when we don't seek knowledge. We can easily be deceived when we're not rooted in knowledge. We can, um, it says in his word, thank you, Holy Spirit, again, study to show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, right? So Paul, let's see this note from the Fire Bible. It's the modern English version. Paul gives a strong warning to the church in Rome to be alert to those who bring harm to the church by corrupting the original teaching of Paul and the other apostles. Let's pause there because the Holy Spirit's giving me imagery of Eve in the garden. 
you know, that was the entire MO of Satan. You know, you get, she got this teaching from God. Hey, Eve, don't eat from this tree that's in the center of the garden of every tree you can eat. But this one tree, if you eat of it, you will surely die. And so here comes the serpent, Satan, to say to her, wait, wait, hold on. Right. As we see in this line, if you take a look at this line, go ahead and um, jot this down in your notes. It says here, corrupting, right? Corrupting. Let me move that out of the way for you. It says here, corrupting the original, the original teaching of Paul and the other apostles. So what happened to Eve? I mean, come on. All the enemy did was take the original teaching that God had given her and Adam. And what did he do? He corrupted it. He corrupted it. So let's continue. They are to closely watch false teachers and avoid them and their ministry. Mm, Come on. Watch the false teachers Avoid them and their ministry. You know, you almost can, you know, I don't know how we could all do it. Cause you know, you guys, we, we got a lot going on. I'll just say that is that, you know, just, just evaluate, you know, how, how long does this person talk before I actually hear the word of God? And when they do talk, how much of the word do I hear? You know, how much of it is opinion? And how much of it is actual word? You know, that's why sometimes you'll even hear me say in your belief system, because we don't all believe the same. We don't. I mean, we, it would be nice if we did, but we, we, we don't always all believe the same. But there are some mandates and some general things in the word that, that we all want to say, okay, there is no debate. We all agree on this. And so he's saying, closely watch false teachers and avoid them. That's what Paul is saying. Okay. And it's the same thing that, you know, we have to think about even today during our church age. So let's continue. They are to closely watch false teachers and avoid them and their ministry. This passage probably referred to those who are against the law and who taught that because salvation is by grace, saving faith does not necessarily include obeying God's moral laws. And there's a big sad face there because we still, right? Just because uh, faith came by grace alone, we also know that there are some truths that we still have to obey. You know, God said is obedience is better than sacrifice. Uh, Rebellion is as witchcraft. And so we've read through verses one, chapters one through 15 with Paul. And he was saying, hey, you know, does grace abound? Grace abound just so we can continue in sin? He said, "I, I, I, I hope not. I hope not. So let's continue. These false teachers believe that a person could actually continue to ignore God's standards and disobey Christ and yet still be spiritually and eternally safe. They were eloquent and persuasive using comforting words and flattering speeches, but in reality, they were deceivers. Oh my gosh. And that's back in Paul's day, right? So what do you, so what do we think it's, it's going on now? You know, again, that's why we have to line whoever's speaking, including myself. You're listening to me, search the scriptures and see what I'm saying, right? On some matters like, you know, which days the holy days, which days we eat, what things we eat, you know, those things we don't have to come into agreement. But the other things, you know, where he says thou shall not murder, he, God ain't changed his mind on that. So grace don't wipe that out. So there's some moral laws that we still have to, to obey. You know, one of my uh, favorite verses that he, if I read recently is in John chapter 17, and he says, they, I'm paraphrasing, they that love me, right? They keep my word. They follow my word and that my father will love them. 
and me and my father will come and make our home. One translation says, we'll take up residence with them. So Jesus is saying, hey, don't call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I, I say to do. Grace did not, in my belief system, erase that. What does that mean? Grace allows us, though, to confess our sins, right? First John, confess our sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us of all, all of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's continue. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta constrain, construct, allow the Holy Spirit to define your belief system. And so verse 19, everyone has heard about your obedience. Listen to that. Paul was talking about this church. So I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good. Check this out and innocent about what is actually evil. Oh my gosh. I like that. Let's read that again. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Man, it sounds like almost like a um, oxymoron, oxymoron. So let's see what, what is this word innocent, innocent. Let's take a look at this in the Strong's Concordance. And so if you know, um, you have, it's an adjective that Paul is using. And one way we can think of innocent is unmixed or pure or simple or blameless or sincere. So you will see in some translations, they'll actually use the word simple instead of innocence. And then again, um, it tells you further information on 185, properly, not mixed, not a destructive mixture, not tainted, check that out, by sinful motives. So Paul is saying he wants all of us to not be tainted by sinful motives or ambition. So he's saying, I want you to be innocent about everything regarding evil. Just be innocent. And here, check this quote out. Like a child whose mind has not been exposed to evil, or mixed with the values of the world. Check out 1 Corinthians 14, 20. In practical terms, being wise about what is good, listen to that, wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil literally means to be experts. Come on, we could. Uh, I want you to pause the video if you need to on that one and write that one down. He's telling us there to be experts right here, to be experts in doing good and unskilled at doing evil. Okay. But you know, and I don't want to make excuse for it, but we do also know that we are not perfect. So we literally can't be experts or we would need Jesus Christ. It's just that we get better every day with his power and that we strive to do good. We strive to do good and we do all that we can to avoid evil. So take a listen to this quote found in the fire Bible and it reads regarding the word innocent or being innocent to that which is evil. At the same time, they must avoid foolishly exposing themselves to evil behavior or participating in ungodly activities. Becoming experienced in issues and areas of ungodly behavior simply gives Satan more opportunities to tempt and trouble us with sin and guilt in the future. But when we avoid evil and refuse to participate in ungodly behavior, we deny Satan the opportunity to tempt us with certain things because we are innocent and unmixed in those areas. Man, so if you wanted a good, uh, something to elaborate that thought, that was a good way to do it. Uh, all we have to do is when we think about this um, being unskilled at doing evil, all we have to do is think about that tree. You know, when Adam, when he ate from that tree, it was called what? The tree of the knowledge of good and what? Evil. 
So originally we were not supposed to even know about evil. So seeing that phrase unskilled at doing evil, unfortunately we can't go back to that pre that state back in Adam where we don't know evil because we have a sinful nature. We were all born with a sinful nature. That's why Jesus Christ said we must be born again. Because what Adam did, I'm paraphrasing this. He messed this up, (laughs) y'all. Adam and Eve. He messed this up. So we're doing everything we can, or Jesus Christ has done it. Let me correct myself. He's finished it. That's why he says, it is finished. What is the it? It is a whole lot in there. But one thing that's it is that, hey, Adam gave you all the knowledge of of good and evil, but I have come to pay the price because you all will execute evil because you will inherit a sinful nature. But I will come as the perfect living sacrifice and my blood will be shed on your behalf. So Paul is reminding us that just because we are saved doesn't mean we don't have any work. We have to daily grind and and keep our um, flesh under subjection, right? So Paul even says that I myself won't be a castaway. I daily beat my body. He was not talking about just a good exercise routine. We're talking about that sin nature, that sin, sinful man that we all have and that we um, have be, been declared righteous, but a righteous, but we have a soul, we have a mind, we have a will that every day Satan is looking to tempt us. All right. Well, I don't know if it's every day, but you know what I mean. All right. Let's continue with verse 20. The God of peace. Here we go. Come on, Paul. The God of peace. I got to stop there. Shalom. If you're under my voice, remind yourself that he is the God of shalom. He is the God of wholeness. He is the God of peace. And then check this out. Paul says, we'll soon will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So here was my question. Why did Paul say soon? Why does he, why does he say soon? Because Jesus Christ has already died, right? So, you know, develop your belief system. Go ahead and think about it. I want to elaborate, but one of the things that comes to my spirit is, you know, I think of the um, definition of where we're at right now. We're in an already but not yet kingdom. So Jesus Christ has said it is finished. The payment has been made. But we are still waiting for that day for that great serpent, Satan himself, to be cast into the lake of fire and all of his demonic forces. And so when you listen to Paul say that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet, one of the things I think about is that not yet part of the kingdom right? Where Jesus Christ comes back, the trumpet is sounded, right? The the angels are at the different parts of the earth and the harvesters come and the wheat and the chaff are separated. So I think that Paul is referring to that. Do your further script, actual further research to see what you come up with. Um, But again, this is just a a reference back to Genesis again. Because in Genesis 3.15, I have a little comment that I added there. This language echoes Genesis 3.15, wherein God declares that the serpent's head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. Well, who's the seed of the woman? We're talking about Mary. We're talking about Jesus Christ, our living King, seated on the right hand of the Father. All right, so that might take further study for you. So let's continue on with verse 20, uh, the remainder of these verses, greetings from Paul's fellow workers. So verse 21, Timothy. So they're all like chiming in. Think of this as like a massive text and everybody's getting in on it or a TikTok. Uh, well, I don't know if it, if it could be a TikTok video, but you know what I mean? Everybody got to get their thing in. So here we go. 21, Timothy, my fellow worker sends you greetings. 
as do do Lucius, Jason, and Sosa. Well, let me make sure I say this right. Sosipater, Sosipater, my fellow countrymen. Okay, so he's saying, hey, they're they're, they're sending you a, a shout out here. Verse twenty one, verse twenty two. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. So they're saying from research that Tertius was Paul's secretary and that he wrote the letter, but Paul dictated this letter to him. And then you have Gaius, who hosted me and all the church, sends you greeting. There's that, hey girl, hey, hey guy, hey. And then we have Erastus. The city treasurer sends you greeting as does our brother Quartus. Okay. And then in some, um, from the original sources, when they translated this, some translations will include another, uh, portion to this verse. And it would say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Okay. So there, if you notice, there's a 23, And then it jumps down to 25. So depending upon the source text that they used, there's a 24 that says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So it depends on the translation that you're in. Again, we're in the Berean study Bible. So now we come to one of my favorite parts. Here's a good cross reference that you can look at. This is actually, what do we have? This is Jude chapter one, verses 24 through 25. Okay, if you wanna jot that down, pause the video and jot that down. Jude chapter one, verse 24 through 25. All right, so here we go. He's closing us out with his doxology. Now to him, capital H, who is able to strengthen you by my gospel and by the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery concealed for ages past, but now revealed and made known through the writings of the prophets by the command of the eternal God in order to lead all nations to the obedience that comes from the faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh my gosh. We got to go back on that one. Okay. So that's packed full. I mean, you could probably write a book on and just these last few, few verses. And it says, so Paul is saying, okay, l- let me remind y'all who he is. God, he's able to strengthen us. So highlight that in your Bible, put that in your journal. God is able to strengthen you and strengthen you how? By the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's again, why we read uh, God's word. God is able to, to strengthen us even as we read the scriptures, even as we read his holy word. And then he says it, how does he do it? It's according to to the revelation, right? And the revelation is based on times past, which it was once, it says it was once a mystery, but now my gospel is based on the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Man, that's awesome. And then verse 26, and here's where we come in, right? This is thousands of years ago, but this applies to us now. It's now revealed. It's now revealed, is now made known through what? Through the writings, through the prophets. You know, if you ever do your own research back then in Paul's days, when they would, they didn't have, they wouldn't say the word Old Testament. They would say the writings, and, and the, and the prophets. And it was actually called, if you want to write this in your journal, T-A-N-A-K, the Tanakh, right? And so there were actual, um, in a different language, the T stand for, stood for one thing. And then the N stood for another. And then the K stood for another. There were three sections of what they called, they didn't call it the old Testament. It was the prophets. It was the writings. It was the Psalms. So Paul is saying, hey, this is being made revealed through this. And we need to say the same thing today. 
the truth, the proclamation of Jesus Christ is being made revealed. Now we have the Old Testament, not just the writings and the pro. We have the apostles. We have the New Testament. We have Peter. We have James. We have John. We have Matthew. We have Mark. But it's our job to get into the, those books and to study them, the study which is no longer a mystery because the mystery is on the, was on the cross. He shed his blood for us, but we need still need that guidance through the Holy scriptures. And why look at this, just take a look at this. I think I got to highlight that uh, myself. Go ahead and highlight this in your Bible. He says in order to, here we go. In order to lead all nations, all of them, not just some of them, to the obedience that comes from the faith. You know, right there, you can think about, you know, when um, when you think about the spirit of racism, I won't go in on that. But, the, you know, this gospel is for all nations. We're all made in the image of Christ. So Paul was saying, and if you even researched the long group of people that he listed early in the chapter, Rufus, right? If he's, if he's an African and you have Phoebe, you have people from all, Phoebe was wealthy. You have people from all walks of life, all nations, and it still applies here today. So, and then he closes it out. I got to read it again. To the only, (laughs) to the only, there is no more. To the only wise, the only wise God. And then what does Paul say? What is to that God? The glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And amen. Now there, um, it's said to be that there's some notes on where they actually place verses 25 through 27. Some of the older manuscripts, it doesn't matter right now in my Bible, your Bible, we have verse 27 to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. So now let's just take a Selah or a Selah now that we've gone through all of that. And let's just talk for a minute. You know, we had questions at the very beginning that we were able to just reflect and keep in the back of our minds as we read through the actual Bible. Um, remember, we're interacting with the text, not just studying it. I think you can do two simultaneously. You don't have to do either or. So let's just take a look at those original questions questions that we had at the beginning. When you read this chapter, now now that you finished it, what life lessons did you notice or did can you add since you finished the a chapter now is there anything that you could add to it? And then in the chapter, where do you see the community of Christ? We've gone through it and we've seen Phoebe and we've seen all those names, uh, Gaius and all of that, those names that were difficult to pronounce. Um, Where do you see the community of Christ being developed? And then how, according to you, after you've read, how, what does the Holy Spirit reveal to you about how important godly relationships are? And then after reading, and if you don't have the answer, that's okay. You can go in prayer and ask God to reveal it to you. Who has God placed in your life that those people are just helping you to become? They're just helping you to become. One thing that I'm learning, even as I mature in Christ is, and even trying to go back and study, you know, just look at the time. Who did he pour his time in? He poured, he, he interacted with many, but there weren't many that he was in relationship with. A relationship is where two parties are exchanging benefits. And so sometimes we find ourselves in what we think are relationships, but they really aren't. So you, so all of us have to ask ourselves, who's helping us to become and how are we helping that person to become? That's where you want to spend the energy and time in your relationship. If you have somebody in your life and they're not just helping you to become dot, 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 that means whatever God has ordained for you to become, they're either helping you to become that or they're not. 
or they're draining things from your life and they're not putting in the, any deposits in. So you want to spend your energy developing that Christian community in your life. So take a listen to this. There is, if we look back in the chapter, remember, pause it if you need to, to answer those questions and reflect. But as we look, there is a mix of both Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, men and women, marrieds and singles, leaders and followers, those in vocational Christian ministries and those in regular vocation, those in government and civilians and slaves and free. You can find it that in the CSB Life Essential Study Bible. What does that mean? Is that the kingdom of God, when you look at chapter 16, right? God does not have this one size fit all. Not everybody will be married. There were some people who have been born in this world to be single. Look at Paul. You know, I know that a lot of times that's hard to swallow. Usually us women have more of a difficult time following that. And then notice they're leaders and followers. Paul was clearly a leader. Phoebe was leading in her own way, but she helped to follow. She helped Paul to become. Priscilla and Aquila helped Paul to do the things that God had ordained for him to do. There are people who um, were tent makers that we read in the Bible. There are people who are dedicated solely. Most of their time is dedicated to um, the kingdom to studying, to bringing the word. And so not one size fits all. And we have to remember that as we study God's word, and even if, when we're trying to live our life, we don't want to live a pattern after somebody else. Believe me, I could answer that for you. I mean, you just waste a whole lot of time in life trying to do that. And then check this out. This is from um, Max Lucado, and I believe it's called the Encouraging Word Bible. And it says, these saints were spurred by a gut level conviction that they had been called by no one less than God himself. Think about, have you, you've been called by no one less than God himself. As a result, their work wasn't affected by moods, cloudy days, or rocky trails. Their performance graph didn't rise and fall with roller coaster irregularity. Man, that Max Licato can sure write. They weren't addicted to accolades or applause, nor deterred by grumpy bosses or empty wallets. Rather than service to be spectacular, they aspire to be accountable and dependable. And since their loyalty was not determined by their comfort, they were just as faithful in dark prisons as they were in spotlighted pulpits, reliable servants. They're the binding of the Bible. Their acts are sincerely or rarely mentioned, rarely, rarely mentioned, and their, na their names are rarely mentioned. Their acts are rarely recited. Yet, were it not for their loyal devotion to God, many great events never would have occurred. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He's reminding me of John the Baptist in the wilderness. He said, covered with camel's hair, eating locusts and honey. And Jesus said, there, will, there has been none until the kingdom of heaven that will be greater than John the Baptist. And so we, we learn a lot. You know, I have to be honest, when I started this chapter, I was like, oh my gosh, look at all these names. What am I going to get from this? Right. But I've learned a lot even from that chapter. And I hope you have learned a lot as well. So like we do, what's your reaction? You can scan mine below. So here we are with my favorite reminder from that great man of God, Joshua. In Joshua 1 and 8, he tells us that this book of the law, shall not depart from our mouths, but we shall meditate on it day and night so that we may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. 
For then we will make our way prosperous and then we will have good success. And so if you're under the sound of my voice, this is an opportunity. If you are not saved, do not allow this this opportunity to pass you by. We bind any spirit that would hinder you from receiving God into your life as your Lord, Savior, and King. So if that is you, just go ahead and I want you to take in Romans 10, 9 through verses 13. Um, You just repeat after me and he says, God, um, just lift up your hands right now, even if you can uh, in this moment and just repeat, God, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And because of that, I am saved. God, I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ has justified me and made me right. God, he has freed me from the guilt of sin and made me acceptable to you. And I acknowledge this openly and I confess it. And this results in my salvation, God, because your word says, whoever believes in him, I adhere, I trust, and I rely on you. And because of that, God, I will never be disappointed. For thank you, God, that there is no distinction between me, a Jew or Gentile, for you are Lord over us all. God, I thank you that today I call on your name and therefore I am saved. Again, go back and read that in Romans 10, 9 through 13 and solidify it. This is in the Amplified Translation. Don't let anybody talk you out of your salvation from this day forward. So today we end, wrap up with our closing and intercessory prayer, because not only do we pray, we pray for each other. Remember Christ in community. So today, join me as we close out. Father, we want to thank you for being the faithful and good God that you are. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for breathing upon us and giving us the Ruach. God, we thank you that we see this day, a day that we've never seen before. Father, we thank you, as our teacher Beth Moore even mentioned, that we are to look north and south, north up to the throne of heaven and south down to the pages of scripture. Father, we bind any demonic force that will hinder and distract us from walking out the true life you have ordained for all of us. We thank you, Father, that you have called us to be a kingdom of priests and we are a royal priesthood. We bless your holy name. Father, we pray for all of those who are connected to us. So right now, in the name of Jesus, if there's somebody God is placing on your heart, pause this video if you need to, lift them up in prayer. And together we receive the blood sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah and amen. In Jesus' name, amen. So may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May he watch over you. May he smile upon you and be kind to you. May he look on you with favor and give you peace. And lastly, we end with Proverbs 4 and 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get and understanding. And like we decided, we will have decided and intentionally decided that we will praise and we will worship the Lord. He deserves our praise. No one other. There's only one true God and he deserves all of your praise. He deserves all of my praise. So we lift him up and we exalt him in the earth. We thank him for being our Lord and King. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for being a part of this His Taught Ones family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.